You're listening to The Portfolio Composer, hosted by me, Dr. Garrett Hope, where business and creativity go hand in hand. Join us at theportfoliocomposer.com for news, talks, and workshops. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Dorico Pro 3 is a major new version with game-changing advances in note input, notation, and engraving. Also available from Steinberg is Dorico Elements, an entry-level application that packs all of the essential power of Dorico Pro into a simple, streamlined package that is ideal for those getting started. Find out more later in the show. Hello, and welcome to episode 239 of the Portfolio Composer podcast. I'm your host, your coach, and your teacher, Garrett Hope. And I want to start by letting you know that plans for the Ultimate Music Business Summit 2022 are well underway. We have several dozen incredible presenters and a keynote speaker that's going to blow your mind. This is going to be a fantastic event. It'll take place the first weekend of January, so January 6, 7, and 8. And if you want to be the first in line to reserve your spot and get your ticket, go to musicsummit.biz. That's musicsummit.biz and get your name on the list because this can transform your business and it can transform your ability to make money and support yourself in the long run. Today's episode is with Rebecca Carriord and Jan Ekstrand. And please forgive me, Rebecca and John, for butchering your names because my Scandinavian pronunciation is just atrocious. Um, But you guys are incredibly gracious individuals, and I thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. So for the listeners, Rebecca is a composer and musician originally from just south of the Arctic Circle in northern Norway. Over the course of her career, she has composed music for over 30 films, modern dance performances, and theatrical pieces, as well as released six solo albums under her own name. John is a Swedish film composer with electronic music background and began his career as a sound engineer and sound designer. This was a wonderful conversation on collaboration and empathy, letting go of ego, and making good music. Enjoy. Hello, Rebecca and John. Hello. Welcome to the Portfolio Composer Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So as I was describing to you before we started rolling tape, so to speak, the name of the podcast is borrowed from the business and investment community with the idea of having a diversified portfolio of assets. And as creatives, I firmly believe that we create a portfolio of income-producing activities. So some that composers normally do is we get paid to write music, a commission. We also license our music. We sell scores and recordings and we teach and there's various other things. And everyone builds their own portfolio. It's unique to them and their talent set and what they're interested in. And I want to know what is in your portfolios. All right. Rebecca, you're me. (laughs) Who's first? You you go. You go. Okay. Okay. I go. Uh... In my portfolio, I mean, I started off in making really bad electronic music in the 90s. And I started off as a sound engineer on films. So I think that's been my kind of start off and building a buffer and getting into the business. And I think I never thought that I could make a living uh, of being a composer, especially in Sweden. I mean, it's 10 million people in Sweden. Uh, So the industry is not that big. And I think doing international movies was never on the horizon ever 20 years ago. But then I kind of fell into composing and had the sound engineer thing on the side also. So I did 50-50 and it wasn't until 14 years ago uh, or 12 years ago I could really live out of being a composer. But since then I haven't really done anything else in my kind of portfolio because then I've just been full on composing and not doing I've done some sound banks and so forth but not that much and that was a while ago also but I did a couple of ones when I began but since then I've just been composing and living out of composing but you are licensing your previously recorded music yeah of course but I get you know residuals from the music for the movies that I make but I only write film music nowadays I don't write any music for myself or or anything I only write for productions Sure. That's fantastic. Yeah. One of the things that you kind of highlighted in your story there is how our portfolios can change over time based on opportunity or interest or the luck that we have. And you moved from the engineering side to the composing side, and there was a balancing act for a while. 
thank you for sharing that. Rebecca? Yeah, I guess I started in film and theater when I was 12 as an actor, actually. I was a child actor. And then music and acting, working in front of the camera went parallel for many years for me throughout my teenage years. And then I educated, actually. First, I went to music school and then I went to theater school and I had problems choosing. And then music just took over more and more. And at some point, it became very evident that I felt more familiar in music and with music, being myself on stage instead of being someone else. And I felt more freedom in creating my own projects and my own circumstance and frame than being picked by others, which you do as a film composer. But I've always had my own stuff as well. And that has been a huge asset. So At the point when I chose to quit acting, I actually had done a lot of films and stuff. It was a very like unsentimental, conscious, liberating choice. And then a lot of the directors that I had worked with started to ask me if they could use my music in their films. So it was a super smooth transition, very organic and safe in a way. And I think in my portfolio, there's definitely a narrative understanding and emotional understanding of dramaturgy from working with a manuscript on a deep emotional level. I think I took that with me into writing music because I have like a huge trust in my intuition when it comes to what I hear and feel when I see imagery. And then over the years, I have been very broad, kind of. I've been doing a lot of different things, modern ballet, theater, film, a lot of small, narrow film. Uh, But I think I've always had this belief that whether the project is huge or small, whether I have a lot of pay or little pay from it, I should always do my best because that becomes a valuta in itself, a currency. Yes. Like that becomes a value and that in the end will be more worth than money, kind of. And I still really believe in that. I I think that was wise. I mean, sometimes you can feel that being very versatile, I don't know how it is in the US, but in Europe, being a Renaissance person is not so good. (laughs) Oh, really? It's like kind of frowned upon a bit because they're like, oh, so you're like, I've been hiding at times that I did act. And now I'm like, no, it's part of that portfolio that you talk about. It's part of the whole asset. Yeah. It's not like it was a failure or something I left behind because it didn't work. It was like, you know, there's many many lives in one, in one life and there's many careers I think in one career. Yeah. There's something you said in your story that I want to jump back to. Mm. You use the phrase being picked by others. And you did recognize that a film producer or director chooses you for the project, but you were intentional it seemed to create your own opportunities. Can you tell me more about that and how are you still doing that? Yeah, I feel like if I create my own projects, it gives me, I mean, we have the fortune of living in a part of the world where there's a lot of state funding for projects. So that, I guess, enables me to be creative and to think, okay, I want to do this project with that composer in Italy or in France or in the US, and I can apply for money for it. And then I create the circumstance where One, I get to develop something. For example, I want to write for a big orchestra or I want to work with two guitars that I haven't done before. And I get confidence. And number two in that. And three is that I get exposure and I get exposure with something that I've chosen and I get to amplify my voice within something that I've chosen. And that, again, generates commissions. It's always like that. Every time I do something out of myself, it generates commissions. More than like reaching out and sending emails to producers or directors and saying, hi, I'm here. Can I work (laughs) with you? (laughs) (laughs) I just love that. And it affirms everything I believe and that I've been saying in the podcast too, because you've taken the power and owned it rather than letting other people validate you or to choose you, you make it possible yourself. So I just applaud you all the way. I love it. Thank you. There was something else you said, and I would love both of you to comment on it. You were talking about how being a Renaissance person in Europe is frowned upon. Uh, One phrase that's common in America is being a Jack or Jill of all the trades, right? Mm. Rather than specializing. And what I heard you saying is that in Europe, people prefer specialization. Is that an accurate understanding of what you were saying? It's my understanding. I don't know. What do you think, Jon, about that? Yeah, but I think so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah? 
But I think it's true. It's, it's a little bit frowned upon. I think it's good to be niched and or well, you fall into certain slots also. I think at least in Sweden, if you're a film composer, you're a film composer. If you write for commercials, you write for commercials. If you write for theater or dance, you're a dance. You know, it's, mm. you really fall into these kind of slots, I think. So for the two of you who are doing a wide variety of things... In what ways is it difficult for you to continue forging your own path rather than just falling into a label? It doesn't really suit my mindset to formulate it like that. Oh, really? Okay. I would rather say that there are several ways to work around that challenge and that resistance. For example, collaboration. Our collaboration with the Greta film or with the HBO series we're doing now, it really breaks up people's expectations of what John does and it breaks up their expectations about what I do. And it blends into something. It's like a synergy that surprises people a little bit. It shakes it up a bit. <laughs> huh? Plus you get the competence of the other person and you get introduced to another person's network of musicians, of producers. Like it's a huge win-win in that. And I think that is a way also of breaking up these roles that we get to reach out, go outside the comfort zone, reach out and work with people that is not good at exactly what you're good at. Yes. Great answer. Yeah. John, did you have any thoughts on that? I'm with Rebecca on that one. No, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's so true about the gift of collaboration is really fantastic. And, and especially because it's a lonely work of being a composer. And I think getting the new ideas between the projects is also good to do collaborations. And I prefer to do collaborations like every second job I do uh, or project. Mm which is fantastic because it's really, is, uh, yeah, it becomes something else, I think. And also it's for every project, when you get to a certain position that you can actually get some nice projects, I think it's about to choose the projects that you evolve in also, that you can evolve and do something new with and always try to do something maybe not that expected. Mm. I think a good thing to have that mindset when you go into a project, okay, what can I do that is different to compare to everybody else who's done this before? I really like how you guys are viewing this. And I would love to talk about your creative process as collaborators. I mean, John, you said it, that composing is a lonely endeavor. And when I'm writing music, I want to obviously have my input in all the decisions so how do you guys work through that? How do you create a cue and make decisions? What is your process for collaborating? First of all, there is good collaborative energy and there's bad. And music is a fragile thing. Sometimes it can really, if there's not, like not safe and good energy in a studio or in a room, it can totally die and lock up. I've experienced that more times than I've experienced what I feel is happening with John, that it's a total flow super safe, super efficient, really creative. I mean, it's remarkable. And that it happens a few times in your life. I, I mean, I'm not kidding. That's rare. So I can only say with Greta and with the HBO series that we're working on, it's been very easy to divide the work task between us and uh, to understand which one of us is better at certain things. And from that, okay, you need me there. I need you there. It's been very easy, I must say, so far, and very creative and fun. What's it like for you, John? Complete opposite. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> no, I'm no, kidding. No, no, but I, I mean, it's, it's as Rebecca says, it's so rare to get a good collaboration with somebody where you feel safe. And because it's a little bit, it's, it's a delicate thing writing music together. And it's a really sensitive thing because it's, it's. Mm -hmm. Something that, that you care a lot about and then you feel vulnerable often, I think, when you present mm -hmm. music to somebody else. And it's really about meeting somebody that allows you to work together with the guard down on the same premises. When that happens, it's magic. And as Rebecca said, it's, when we're working together, it's actually amazing. It's fantastic. You learn so much and you have so much fun also it's it's very efficient but it's a lot of fun doing it also it's not just fun writing music but a fun vibe you know it's mm. it's a lot of laughter <laughs> that's good yeah there's, there's a lot of goofing around yeah yeah definitely, definitely. <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely a lot of goofing around <laughs> 
Well, I imagine the idea of collaboration sounds really good to a lot of composers who are listening. And I've had fruitful collaborations. I love collaborating, but I'm often collaborating with people in other fields. Mm. I'm not collaborating with other composers. So I think trying to understand this better for myself, give me an example of a bad collaboration, something that you've experienced without throwing anyone under the bus. You don't have to use names. You guys are saying that this is so fruitful for the two of you. You bring new energy into it. And there's not competition. So what does a bad collaboration look like? Because so much drama in, in, mm. in everything. I think it's that, that it's when feelings are getting hurt. It's like a relationship, I think. I think it has to be so balanced in that everything is also clear from the beginning. What's the assets? What are you willing to give to this relationship or this constellation? I think if that's clear from the beginning and everybody's on the same playing field, I think it makes it so much easier. And when those kind of things doesn't exist, I mean, I've had a couple of really bad collaborations that were didn't end well in the end, you know, because it's very hard and sometimes people get hurt. And yeah. It's related to who you are as a person, how processed you are, how willing you are to... Big to compromise? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and if, if there's two big egos, and we've all had big egos at times and then you meet someone who maybe grinds down that ego in the right way or shows you a side that allows you to not work with your ego so it becomes like an honesty instead like we've had situations where we've had to be extremely honest with each other hmm. like okay yeah. but if this is how this job is to look then I would like to have it this way how does that feel for you or, no, if this feels like this, I don't want to be a part of that. Okay, but that's not okay for me because I want to be loyal to you. Like, it's like a relationship and you have to be very loyal and honest. Sure. If you're going into processes where there's money involved, where there's contacts involved with people that you worked with before and you're introducing someone else into that world, there's a lot to risk, but there's so much to win. Yes. If you dare to do that. So I want to summarize what you said, the two of you. I'm getting so much out of this conversation. A lot of it has to do with letting your ego go because things are fragile. Composing is intimate and kind of soul exposing. Mm. That's, I think, what you were hinting at, John. Yeah. There's some fear in that. And then being honest. So Rebecca, I'd love to ask you, how do you be honest in a collaboration while still having a respectful conversation? Because sometimes when you're approaching it from that place of vulnerability, our honesty is really an excuse to say brutal things. Mm. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. We can say hurtful things and we'll just say, oh, but I'm being honest. And that's not the kind of relationship you're talking about here. So how do you foster and develop the ability to speak honestly while respecting the other person and not going to attack them? I think that's about maturity and it's about empathy. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. goes for not just collaborating with other composers. It goes for the whole complex process of making film or making music. You have to have your empathy with you on your shoulder all the time. And it goes for life too. I mean, empathy is something that we're really lacking in this day and age. I think it's increasingly, I, I think about that so much when you look at politics or you look at climate change or you look at mm -hmm. polarity in society and a lot of things we're struggling with. So it's a big question and it's a small intimate question. And I think it always comes back to empathy, actually. You're allowed to be honest, but not to any cost. You have to, <laughs> right. to think a little bit like, yeah. okay, how do I formulate this? I mean, I never bring up huge things with John before I've been thinking about them for a few days. And John usually, I'm not, I don't mean to expose you, John, but he usually never answers right away if it's big things. He goes a few days and then I'm like, okay, yeah, he needs to process this. <laughs> I know. <him> right now. <laughs> and yeah. It's okay, you know, it's how it is. <laughs> I think that's a healthy thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. No, no. In the end, Everything while you're there is because of the movie. Is yeah. you're making a collaboration for a movie, for a product. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing in this whole situation is the product. So whatever is good for the product, and that's about the whole thing about solving your ego, it's really what's good for the movie. And if you're a good composer, you can see that probably if that cue that you kind of one person maybe like and the other person doesn't like, 
maybe it's you know it's not supposed to be in there it's not best for the movie so it's about swallowing your ego and i think a good mm. composer can swallow your ego and say like okay but <laughs> of course you're right this sucks i don't know what i've been doing the last <laughs> couple of days this is the worst cue ever yeah. this is <laughs> you know it's, it's you know, I, I think both me and rebecca has really we're really honest about that and i think we get along so well so it's not a problem of telling the other one that it's like yeah but this is maybe not that good you know and and, so, <laughs> and, and i think we get it sure but we say it to each other in a nice way and i think that's good and we say it always with a good intention i think also if it's something mm. and i think that's the important thing this episode is sponsored by dorico the future of scoring and we want to feature real Dorico users so you can know that real composers out in the world today are using Dorico to make their careers happen. I'm Nathan Howe. I do mostly choral music because of flows, because it w- thinks in flows. I spend so much less time trying to get those things to appear naturally on the page and to work together to flow right into each other in Dorico. Maybe I want to add an extra beat in other programs, if I do that, I break a lot of things and I have to go do a lot of cleanup. Dorico will automatically adjust note lengths. It knows that that note goes for a certain duration and it'll give me the best look for that duration based on the presets that I've told it to do. When I'm writing for piano, the way Dorico handles voices is so good because so often you don't need a voice for very long. You need it just for, you know, a suspension that that happens in the right hand. And then you you don't need that voice for the rest of the piece. You can turn it on and off at will and you don't have all these rests hanging out that then you have to hide. You can just start the voice where it starts and end it where it ends and it's done. I can compose in Dorico. For me now, I compose directly into Dorico more often. I still use pencil and paper once in a while, but I'll compose into Dorico because my workflow is fast enough that it can keep up with with what I want to do. It's faster for me than than writing it out longhand to to start. Yes, I recommend Dorico. Overall, it's the most natural music notation software I've used, and my workflow is just so much faster than it was with other software. I started with the first, uh, you know, 1.0 or 1.1, and uh, and the growth in Dorico over that time has been tremendous. Uh, I love how responsive the developers are. I'm, I'm not only excited about using Dorico now, I'm excited to see how it develops over the next few years, because it's active development, which I don't see other places. The kind folks at Dorco have set up a special web page so you can go and download a free 30-day trial copy of Dorico. So go and do that. I have been using the program, and I'm absolutely in love with it. Go to www.steinberg.net slash TPC. Something you said about being kind of honest in our creative endeavors remind me of the phrase. I can't remember who said it, but it's to kill your darlings. Have either of you heard that phrase before? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All yeah. the time. <laughs> it's the idea that, you know, we create something and we fall in love with it because we created it, but it may not actually fit that cue, what John was hinting at. Yeah. So you have to be willing to remove kill your darling. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons that we are talking today is because of one of your recent collaborations, the film I Am Greta, which was released just a few months ago in the middle of the pandemic. So let's talk about that. So it was premiered at the Venice Film Festival. Was that virtual event or did they hold that in person this year? How did they do that? They actually held it. I was there. John was on his way to L.A. for another project. And I was there and it was really bizarre. It was scaled down. But yeah, it's like they measure your temperature when you go into the festival area and it's social distancing and the audience sits with like five seats apart. (laughs) And it was really weird. (laughs) But it was a beautiful experience to at least have one premiere because all the other premieres have been canceled. Yes. Yeah. Putting art out into the world right now is a very strange experience, isn't it? Yes, it's like a huge school in acceptance, everything right now, I find. Yeah, and it's scary too with the cinemas and you hope people stream the films and uh, see them in different forms. 
Yeah. Well, in the United States, the film is available on Hulu, which I think was one of the primary producers of the film. Is that accurate? Yes. Yep. So this was created as a for Hulu type thing, right? It wasn't actually designed for a theatrical release. Is that true? I think it was both, actually. Really? Yeah, they were planning for a short cinema release worldwide. But that kind of, uh, yeah, got scaled down because of the pandemic. Yeah. But I think the initial thought was actually to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, the nature of the film is inherently political. And so I would love to know your thoughts on that, because a normal dramatic film, and Rebecca, you were speaking about this, when you read a script, you bring your dramaturgy to it. How do you bring that same level of character development and process into a documentary that is dealing with something that is so, well, it's a hot button issue? Mm. Well, first of all, for my sake, I think it's the same for you, John, but we're both people who care about the climate issue a lot. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of respect and admire Greta Thunberg a lot. So we went in with a lot of enthusiasm and energy to help lift that issue. And it's not that often as a musician, you get those chances to do something humanistic or political in this way, where you feel like, okay, maybe this music can touch people. So it actually raises the questions and lifts her clarity and task and mission. Uh, So that was one part that felt really clear. Then it is obviously tricky or a challenge to write music to a film about a young, rather vulnerable person who is very much alive right now in everyone's minds, like in the present tense. And there's a lot of considerations to be taken from everyone who's worked on this film. How much should she be exposed? How close should one go? And there's a lot of opinions about that on the film. Like some people, some reviewers are like, oh, it doesn't reveal anything about her. But in Sweden, it's kind of the opposite. It's like, wow, it's very intimate and we get to know new things about her. So it's not a film that will be judged only on artistic premises. It will be judged on political premises and a lot of other aspects too. But we were very cautious about not letting the music be too leading, I think. Not too sentimental, not too manipulative. Trying to rather work with energy and what we felt intuitively that she has in her. Yeah. When I listened to the score and I listened to the whole thing, I didn't get that sense that you were leading me through the emotional drama. Instead, I felt like you were creating this swirling, complex, emotional bed because it's a complex issue, right? Yeah. That's a fantastic response. I think that's exactly what we wanted. Yeah. Well done then. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) John, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think uh, Rebecca put it really, really well. (laughs) I'm with Rebecca. (laughs) (laughs) Yay! (laughs) What is one thing that you guys learned through scoring the film? It could be about the process of the music. It could be about the activism Greta's doing. But what's one thing that really resonated with you that you walked away from it changed by? You want to go, John? Yeah, that Rebecca is a really, really great person to work with and uh, also a fantastic (laughs) person. No, but seriously, I think that actually that's one of the main things that I carry away from the project, to be honest. The whole collaboration, I think that's what I I, 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 uh, dear the most. Hmm. And was this your first collaboration? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're working on HBO series, but that was just, we did a few sessions prior to Greta. So we were really thrown into the fire with Greta because they were super late with post-production. It was a lot of hassle in the production and a very young and nervous director and a lot of um, control needs around the music, temp music that they'd grown fond of. It was very complicated. So we were really thrown into the fire and we had six weeks to write 70 minutes of music. That's a lot of music. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. So our relationship was really put at, you know, a, a test. Like, okay, how do we deal with this? And I can only agree with John that I think... I remember John said to me at some point when I came to the studio and I drove 
my kids had summer holiday and was like away every day from them. Bye, I'm going to work on the the film <laughs> again for two months. And then I was like kind of sad. I came into the studio and he was like, just think about how tough you're going to be after this process. If you can manage this, you're going to manage anything. And that really stuck with me because it was tough. It wasn't an easy film to do. But I learned, I also learned a totally new DAW for the project. So that's something new I took from it. I learned to work with Cubase. There it's a very go. pragmatic thing, but... Go Steinberg! Go Steinberg! <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you'll be happy to learn that Steinberg actually sponsors this podcast through Dorico. Okay, great. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so... Please, Steinberg, send me some freebies. <laughs> <laughs> me too. But I think it was a real eye-opener. I mean... It was one of those projects that doesn't feel like a job. It felt more like a mission to me, at least. Mm. I felt like, okay, this is something that doesn't come around that often. And I feel like I've grown immensely on doing it, actually. Like huge as a person and as a composer. And I feel very hungry to continue something after. It's really like evoking something in me musically that I can't really yet put my finger on what it is. But it has something to do with what I want to explore more with you, John. And I feel like we're like nudging something that's really great. And that was a huge gift from this project, I must say. Yeah, that's a beautiful sentiment. Well, I really appreciate the two of you giving me your time and talking to me so deeply about the art of collaboration. And it's something that I want to explore more in my creative endeavors. To be honest, I'm a little afraid to collaborate <laughs> with a composer. I've collaborated with choreographers, scientists, poets, but never composers. So it's something I need to yeah, do. Do it. No, but I think you should just try it because it always gives something. You always learn something. Even if it's bad things, it's always uh, another step on the journey, you know? It, it's, mm. it, yeah. Yeah. You have to go through bad collaborations to find the good ones too. So it's just start to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one way to try it out could be that one says... Like I recorded a record almost a year ago now with Bryce Dessner and Aaron Dessner, which I've never worked before. I've never played with them. I went into the studio and it was my music. So I had written it. I had the control. But then I knew, OK, I have to let go of control in order to make this happen. And that is not the same like super easy vibe that John and I have because I don't know them. And they're from a different musical world in some regards. But the thing that made that possible was we had five days in the studio and I set certain frames for it, like, okay, we're going to do everything live and I'm going to let go of control and not like pick things apart. And I think that is a way to go about collaborations the first time is to be super prepared and then set certain frames for it, a certain set of rules that everyone's in with, and then let go of control and see what happens. Mm, yeah. And really let go of control them. Not, yes, <laughs> you have to. Uh, be like, okay, th th this is a totally different direction this song or this piece takes that I had imagined, but this is what I agreed upon. So it's not just killing your darlings, it's letting somebody else kill your darlings. Yeah, in front yeah. of you. In front of you, in yeah. In front of you, with no clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a really, uh, yeah, bringing the lambs to the slaughter. It can be brutal, but... Uh, yeah, it can. <laughs> yeah. I definitely had to go and cry sometimes in the bathroom during that recording session. I was like, oh, this is not what I wanted to do, but darn, I, this is the only way. So... Are you happy with the result, though? Oh, yeah, yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. It's something that I could never, ever have achieved alone. Mm, that's the thing, right? Because one plus one is greater than two when you're collaborating. Yes? Yeah, it is. Yeah. But I would say, in a way, I collaborate in all my projects, you know, with the people that I work with, for instance, my orchestrator or my mixer. You know, I, mm. I collaborate with them. I let them have opinions, you know, and also my musical editor, if if it's somebody I trust, I mean, I gladly, if they have any smart ideas, you know? Mm -hmm. You're really good at that, letting go of control in the moment. And, and, yeah, and yeah. also, you're really yeah, good at probably. letting people shine, which yeah. is a super important part. If somebody's better <laughs> at, uh, than me on something, when it comes for orchestration or whatever, I mean, please show me new stuff. I mean, something that I can, I'm all ears. If I don't like it, I'm going to tell you that I don't like it. But if you're honest and direct and not beating around the bush of telling them what you want from the beginning, I think it's always a easier way to collaborate. 
John, I'm wondering if some of that attitude comes from the way you got into what you're doing, because you came through the engineering side, which is always a team-based effort, Yeah. as opposed to like the way I was trained, which was more of the conservatory model, where it's yeah. like, okay, mm. there is a right way to play this piece. There are the rules of music theory, yeah. and mm. everyone has to learn the things, and you yeah. do it right or you do it wrong. And I think there's this, it's not necessarily collaborative, obviously within an ensemble there's collaboration, but there's this sense of control and less freedom to let other people have input. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think you're right. I think you're definitely right. I mean, I've started off as I see myself like a film worker, you know, I work in a film crew. I'm not the composer. I work in a film crew when I do a project. Yeah. Of course, I'm the composer, but I'm the part of the film crew. Yeah, I understand what you mean, that you're part of a team that's telling a story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rebecca, do you have any comments or reactions to that? Yeah, I'm just thinking about the history of that and where we're heading. I mean, in the bigger picture, I think we have to work away from this like idea of the one genius and the hierarchy of that. And I think like in filmmaking, in classical music, in art music, in theater and dance, there is a lot of that perception that the hierarchy is very like a pyramid Mm -hmm. with one person on top. And the way the world is looking right now, we have to collaborate more. We have to break down our egos. And it might sound super big and idealistic, but I truly believe that. And I truly believe that that's going to affect art too. Yeah. So that's the future. (laughs) (laughs) And I think it'll be a good future too. Yeah, I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, again, I want to thank you for your time. You guys are a pleasure to speak with, and the music is just beautiful. For those who are listening to the podcast, again, you can watch I Am Greta, or I should really try to say it like you've said it, Greta. Greta. And on Hulu, it's available right now in the United States, and the soundtrack is available on Spotify and all the places. Of course, we support other composers, so buy the album, because that's important. Thank you so much for your time, Rebecca and John. Thank you. I have a kid. I have a kid yelling at me here. So I have to go. <laughs> oh well, the timing is good. <laughs> Thank you so All much. All right. Thank you, yeah. Garrett. Thank you. This episode of the Portfolio Composer has been supported by Dorico Three, the most advanced music notation software ever created. Dorico is designed to save you time, and it gives you the tools you need to produce beautiful and readable scores fast so you can spend less time fiddling with menus and rules and more time doing what you love, making music. Now you can take Steinberg's music notation and composition software with you wherever you go with Dorico for iPad. Whether you're a composer, arranger, instrumentalist, teacher, or student, Dorico is the ideal app for producing beautiful sheet music that you can share as a PDF or music XML or print directly to your AirPrint-enabled printer. Dorico for iPad is available now in the App Store or learn more at www.dorico.com slash iPad. You can also try the full version of Dorico out completely free of charge for 30 days by downloading the trial version from www.steinberg.net slash TPC. Try it today.